I thought what was interesting about him was the strength that he had as a leader combined with what was obviously a very reflective self-analysis. He could be the father confessor, the motivational speaker, the priest, the judge, the jury, the Lord High Executioner, the puppet master, and the inspirational figure, all in the course of one day. You saw where a particular individuals were starting to become far too important in their own right, and he showed and demonstrated that he could do without them. His relentless need for success and have that desire to do better and to make sure that we don't stand still. You just trusted him. That was a big thing because he'd won so much, you just think, I'm going to go with it. What does it take to be a great leader? That's what people flock here to the London Business School from all over the world to find out. And a lucky few today are going to hear from one of the greats. Now, he's not a billionaire from Silicon Valley. He's not a general who's led his troops into battle. He's certainly not a politician. He is, though, a man who, for more than a quarter of a century, masterminded one of this country's greatest brands. I have studied and analyzed leaders all my life but I never saw one quite as successful as Sir Alex Ferguson. It's my very great pleasure to welcome Sir Alex Ferguson. <laughs> what is the secret of his success? Professor Anita Albersi of the Harvard Business School has studied it. Together, they take classes addressing the next generation of business leaders. Today in London, these students are getting a crash course in leadership, the Ferguson way. So what we're going to be doing is a case study like we do those at Harvard, and this is a good test to see whether you guys are as smart uh, as the, the people <laughs> at Harvard. Many regard him as the best uh, coach in all of sports. Why is he such a great coach? I was going to sit next to me. Um, I would say... Uh, <laughs> I, would, I would say uh, he's won everything there is to win, many times. Uh, Helena? He's got a really strong vision. He wants to win, and he's ruthlessly executing against that every single time. Winning was what Sir Alex did again and again and again. When he retired, he'd won an amazing 49 trophies in his career. Ronaldo! Right foot in, it's a clear header, and this is it! And I just needed a miracle. And of course, we got one. Tries to spread himself as wide as he can! No one's likely to ever match his record of winning 13 Premier League titles and two Champions League trophies. I think, no doubt, he's one of the best coaches ever. Not just because he was my leader. So, in history, my question probably the best one. What does this all have to do with business? Why is this worthy of study at a business school? One person who knows the answer to that question is former Manchester United chief executive, David Gill. He understood that in order to have a successful football team and get what he wanted on the pitch, the business of Manchester United had to be very successful. His leadership skills meant that he could understand what we were trying to do as a club. I think the fact that the club was champions for so many years and it's got such a reputation across the world that you have to put that down to his great management and that had the knock-on effect of uh, creating great financial revenues for the organisations. It's about time I turn it over to the man himself. Please again join me in welcoming Sir Alice Ferguson. Thank you. Tomorrow, the Haydock part of a horse running called Hair Dryer. <laughs> <laughs> Sir Alex's record attracted the attention of one of the world's most successful investors, writer and billionaire Michael Moritz, who made his money backing Apple and PayPal and Google. 
Moritz has been a student of leadership for decades. I started looking around for the people in organizations who had been able to steer uh, an organization to perform at a very high level of excellence consistently for a very long time. And that's what piqued my curiosity about Sir Alex and Manchester United. Sir Alex is the first person to say that his world is football, but the elements and rudiments of leadership are universal skills that are as applicable to a multinational corporation, a Boy Scout troop, a church organization, as they are to a football club. A club made in his image, shaped by his values, forged by his character. Sir Alex Ferguson has legendary status at Old Trafford. As a lifelong United fan myself, I don't claim to be impartial. Ah, welcome. Great to see you. Professor Ferguson. Oh, yeah. But I've always wanted to understand the ingredients of the Fergie formula for success. As I was watching you at London Business School, I was sitting next to a Chinese, a Russian, a Uruguayan, an Italian. Did you ever think you would find yourself lecturing on leadership to the young entrepreneurs from around the world? The, the thing about it, the challenge is it's young people. And I've always, I've always enjoyed my uh, interaction with young people. I've always enjoyed uh, my time as a manager producing young players because with young people, you know, it's amazing how they surprise you when you give them an opportunity. Now, back at the business school, you had on the whiteboard all those people that can crowd in on a football manager yeah. who think they've got a right to have a say, yeah. and you wiped a whole series of them yeah. off. This is a great bit. Where's that duster? Can I draw these? They don't mean a thing. <laughs> they don't mean anything. Oh, so the fans should be here. What was the essence left behind? Well, there's the, the, the core. Look at the core, because you can get trapped in the periphery of things that are happening. Your players and your staff, they're the important issues of the whole thing. And, of course, you hope that then that um, transfers your results into keeping fans happy, because that's my job. Fans just want their team to win, but Ferguson insists that his job involves a lot more than that. Most managers go to a football club because it's a result industry. They're there to turn the fortunes of the first team. That's why they get the job. I never thought that way. My philosophy was to, re to build a football club. Sir Alex made uh, Man United as a club to think in a certain way. I think he modelled the club around his view, around his personality. I think Man United will be always influenced by what he did as a, as a manager in the club. The club is, was made at his image. I think the strength of United is this great family spirit we always created. And people who thrive and be recognised. You don't mean the star players? You're, you're talking about the people no, around the club? Yeah, they're no problem. I mean, players, are, you're with them all the time. That's the difference. As a, as a manager at Manchester United, you can easily walk by someone. A girl come out of the, the office and not recognise them. I wouldn't do that. I would say hello, good morning, whatever. And I think it's that recognition that gives you that strength of a, of a family. There's a dinner lady called Carol. She hammers him. What you got on today? What is that? And he'd laugh and he'd go back at her and he'd talk about her hair or something or whatever. And that's, that's the way he is. People don't see that side of him a lot, but he was really, really good like that. He had this unbelievable ability of remembering everyone's name. Obviously, he knows calf on reception and the laundry girls and the chefs and... Um, the cleaners, you've got 65, 70 players, you've got to remember all the names. Plus the schoolboys, that's another 30 or 40. He knew all the names because he took an interest in what they were doing and how they were progressing. He was the top man, and if he's doing it, then everyone else should be doing it as well. Everyone loved him there in the club. He invited everyone to come for a lunch, uh, for a cup of tea. <laughs> English cup of tea, so it, it, it was a family, it was a family with him.
And leaders often forget that, right? It, that it's just a, as much about the, the ladies doing the laundry uh, and making sure that they're happy as it is about making sure that uh, Cristiano Ronaldo is having a great day. The family Ferguson created at United was inculcated with the values he'd learned from his family, growing up in Glasgow in the 40s and 50s in the shadow of the governed shipyards. I want to get you to look at an image of the place you grew up. Govan. Govan, that's um, shipyards, of course, two clans here. Um, I lived over a mile and a half from there. Um, sometimes I used to go and wait, wait my dad coming out the gates at uh, around about five o'clock. You know, even though the temperatures and the wind that come down that quite, they never stopped them from working, never stopped them from building ships. So toughness against the odds? Absolutely. It's, um, they were never bowed, these people. That was proud to be brought up in that kind of environment. Let's take a look at your parents. Yeah. Yeah. There we are, there's the Fergusons. Yeah. And do you see the, the, the ties? They were footballers on them. They were... Even at that age? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, my dad was a footballer. We, my dad played for Gwentor in, in Northern Ireland. He worked in Harland and Wills in Northern Ireland for a spell. And you didn't want to get on the wrong side of him? Oh, no way. No, he was... He, he wasn't the type that would punish you, but he, his voice was enough. And he was a quiet man, but when he, he, when he, <laughs> he wasn't happy, he, he raised the voice and that was enough. So you didn't want to be on the wrong side of him. He was a stickler for keeping time. Yeah, yeah. Does it sound a bit familiar? Stayed with me all my life. I love to be that way, you know. I'm always that way. But there must have been clashes. Were there, were there moments where you thought... Oh, my dad. any teenager with oh, their dad... Oh, yeah. ..would well, fall out quite badly. We never spoke times. for about seven or eight months for a while because he, he wanted me to go to junior football to you, protect... You didn't speak for seven or eight months? Yeah. He wanted me to go to junior football to protect me if I didn't make it in senior football. Did you learn that sometimes keeping quiet can be just as worrying for someone? Absolutely, yeah. Just as good as for a leader to do? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Quite moments. I remember we were down 3 0 at half time at Tottenham Hotspurs. I never says a word. They're ready to go. I says, the next goal's the winner. Let's go score the first goal and see where it takes us. And we'll score within a minute. He scored with him a minute. He went on to score five. Five three, yeah. You once said something that I think a lot of people would find surprising that when you're looking at a footballer, one of the first things you wanted to do is look at their mum and dad. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. Try and find out what kind of parents they've got, and particularly the mother. We used to say to all the scouts, get the mother. Get the mother on your side because she makes all the decisions. The father, a lot of the times, can be entranced by his son's progress and they're sort of living their boots a little bit, you know? And they're living the glory of the kid. The mother wants to do the best for her son. There's no question about that. So, in terms of dealing with parents, the mother is the most important person. You're great with people's mums. My mum was there and my wife was there. Uh, my girlfriend at the time she was. Um, and you just made them feel comfortable. And I remember them coming out of the, the, the room when we finished and went to the hotel after, and they were saying he was such a nice guy. It was Ferguson's reputation as a disciplinarian that appealed to Manchester United. That and his record at Aberdeen, his team beat the mighty Real Madrid to lift the European Cup Winners' Cup. He arrived at Old Trafford in 1986, and before he could revive a once great club, he had first to tackle a pernicious drinking culture. It was a bit uh, impulsive, I think. I called everyone into the, the gymnasium, all the young, young players, all the staff, all the players. So I said to them, look, I've read all these stories, I've heard all these stories about the drinking culture. Well, I have to tell you, I won't change. You're all going to have to change. That's a fact. I mean, how big a problem was it? Well, I think there was a, a, a genuine, way really bad element of drinking in the afternoons, going away for, you know, from the training ground to spend the whole afternoon drinking. People tell stories. People phone the manager at Manchester United, at Arsenal, Liverpool, tell a senior pair in a pub here, and it happens. It happens. That's a great networking system you have, being the manager at Manchester United. It's a nice word, network. It's spies, isn't it? Yeah, well, you need it, you know. And I then realised to myself, I'm not going to win the league with this team. So we did a fire sale, got rid of about nine players, 
and brought five young players in. People were hungry enough to accept challenge and send the club in a different direction. The new leader of another failing organisation faced similar problems just a few years later. Tony Blair's Labour Party had lost four elections in a row. Now, in a sense, you both did the same thing. You took over losing teams and you had to try and change the culture of those teams. Is that vital for someone who's a leader to, to be prepared to challenge the existing culture, not live with it as it is? Yeah, always the, the, the greatest problem when you're leading an organisation that, that is failing is that you, you take the system as it is and you just try to make it work when it may be the system itself that is at fault. So, in other words, you know, it may be that you, you can't get a political party back to power just by amending the same message. You may have to change it completely. You know, you may have to redraw the whole boundaries of your organisation. You may have, as we had to do with the Labour Party, fundamentally shifted. He asks and demands discipline and respect. We we'll say it's a balanced approach. It's not just showing everyone that he is the guy who has the power. Step one in the Fergie leadership manual, assert control and impose discipline. The 180 degree opposite to discipline is anarchy. Well, anarchy won't achieve a thing because people just shove off in different directions. And so um, discipline is essential for any team to achieve the common objective. And I think that's true of soccer as it's true of the army. So Alex knew that if you didn't have discipline within the organization, anarchy would break out and it would become unwieldy and impossible to manage or to lead. I would get into the training ground at about, about, there about seven, I'd be there to God knows what time. I was still to watch the academy or whatever, and I was fortunate. You arrived very, very early all the time. He was there in his office to check to, to make the, the training. And he uh, was always the first one and always the, the last one to go home. So I, I learned this kind of stuff with him. And that's something that wasn't lost on the players. I well, said, so if he's in early, why are you not? He's been doing it 25, 30 years. Why are you not in before him, or at least near the same time as him, and putting the work in? Turning up on time and training hard were only the beginning of what the boss demanded from his team. I wanted him to be Manchester United in terms of dress, made sure they wore the blazing flannels, wherever they went, in terms of uh, away from home, particular. And why does it matter, though? For a leader thinking, well, who cares? Well, I think you're representing the club that way. You walk through an airport and you see the boys, or you see that badge, there's Manchester United. They're dressed right, you know? So the first time I witnessed that was going to Switzerland um, in a tournament for the youth team. And we're all in our blazers and we all got told in no uncertain terms that you're representing Manchester United, both on and off the pitch. I want you to make sure that you behave yourself around the hotel because people will be watching you. Your lesson, if you were back in that classroom is those little things yeah, matter details. just as much as the big yeah, things. Yeah, absolutely. Details. Yeah. All points to the top of the mountain. Yeah. Anyway. Oh, points to the top of the mountain. Everything can contribute. Yeah, absolutely. Just like talking to the laundry girls or the yeah. canteen staff. Yeah. Everything makes a difference. They all matter. They all matter. A club we united seriously matter. I want to show you a photograph which might give you a thought about some of these issues as well. Let's have a quick look, see if you remember this photo. God almighty. How why did they do that? When was that? That was the 96 Cup final at Wembley. I said to Brian Kidd, 1 0. Those aren't your players, of course, those are Liverpool. Yeah, it's Liverpool, yeah. You turned to Brian Kidd, your assistant. 1 0. 1 0. Well, just because of this? Yeah. Because, because of that. I think that's. I don't know, what would you call it? Arrogance or overconfidence or, I don't know, it was ridiculous. As my, I think it was absolutely ridiculous. Blue shirt, red and white tie and a white suit and a blue flower. Who designed that? And they say, you... it was, they say it was Armani. Yeah. I bet your sales went down. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm still working out what it was. Was it because they're not taking the game seriously? Well, I mean, Jimmy and Ed have like, sunglasses on. But you know, the, mo the most telling part of it is this. Roy Evans and Ron Moran had black suits on. I think they were embarrassed. Liverpool Football Club is a great club of history. 
They've won the European Cup more times than Manchester United. The, between Manchester United and Liverpool, they've won more trophies than any club in Britain. That didn't represent Liverpool. James gets there just first. Cantona! There is to be a memorable end to a poor cup final. Liverpool episode at Wembley where they were wearing the white suits, he would, he would use stuff like that. Like, have you seen these lot? Have you seen what they're wearing? They think they've won it already. Stuff like that would get into your heads that, what do you mean they think they've won it already? Sir Alex had other ways of getting into his players' heads, including what became known as the hairdryer, a term first coined by United striker Mark Hughes. The hairdryer. <laughs> <laughs> The, the hairdryer obviously is a myth. Um, <laughs> let, let, let me just uh, put that out there. But that, that apparently <laughs> was the treatment that underperforming players received from Sir Alex. And so basically, he's standing in close and proximity he would, he would and he's shouting so hard that your hair goes like shout, this. Shout at you and physically blow you out of the room. <laughs> um, Can I show you a little video? Oh, dear me. <laughs> Do you know what's coming? No. We're not lip reading. I wasn't well that day. <laughs> <laughs> if you were like that on the touchline, I wonder what you're like in the changing rooms. Uh, I always wanted to get him off my chest, out of my system, and kick on from there. What I said to them remained in the dressing room. I could be really angry, it could be volatile, it could be. But um, it was over. And the players knew that. They knew that. I never, I never brought up again. I never held a grudge, ever in my life. And when you heard it was called the hairdryer, no, did no. you think... <sighs> I, was, I didn't like it at the time, Yeah. honestly. I was a bit annoyed, you know. But now, I, I, you have to... You have to he can smile. ..put in the, the, the comedy yeah. part, you know? We played Benfica away, got beat. We didn't play well. And he was, he was shouting at me. And I thought I was one of our best players on the day. And I was thinking, oh, what are you shouting at? So I started going back at him, shouting back. And the problem is, which I, I failed to learn quickly, is that the more you shout at him, the louder he gets and the more aggressive he gets and the closer he gets to you. He had that um, skill of, do you, have you got to put your arm around someone or have you got to lose your temper to get the best out of them? I remember him having to go at me at half-time and I had the sort of attitude, right, OK, I'll show him. And played well the second half, so then... He quickly knew how I would respond to him losing his temper. That followed me for the next 20 years, so it was a big mistake early on. Giggsy sometimes would have to do one thing wrong in a half. Half time comes, he, hammered gig he would hammer Giggsy. But that was to show the other players no one's exempt from getting hammered and you better all fix up because I'm coming for you at full time if you don't sort this out. I remember sometimes. Uh... When we do it something bad or we lost uh, some games, he, he kicked the chairs and he kicked the boots, he kicked everything, the, the waters, the drinks, and he's so red and he <laughs> shoot past the ball. It, it's unbelievable, but it, it, it was good because we learned. The great thing about the boss was that the next day it was forgotten and you'd be walking towards him or approaching him the next day thinking, is he going to have a go at me? and he would just crack a joke or he would talk about the next game. And how often was it? You're just genuinely furious, you've got to tell people, and how often was there a bit of calculation? A little bit of... Sometimes, I mean, sometimes I would lose my temper when we win. Now, the real reason for losing your temper is, is because of expectation. I could never visualise us losing a game. You know, when I, by the time I'd picked my team, done the tactics, had my team talk, I was confident we'd always win a game. But, of course, you don't win every game, that's a fact. But when they dropped below their expectation, that annoyed me most, you know? No player was too big to be spared the hairdryer. Ince, Van Nisselrooy, Beckham, following that famous bust-up with a flying boot. No player except, perhaps, Eric Cantona, United's iconic French superstar, who got very different treatment even after a spectacular lapse in discipline. I want to take you back to a moment I suspect is hard for you, let alone anybody else, to forget. Let's just take a look. God. Did you see that? I didn't see it at all. I was looking at the pitch. 
But it is, you know, as you see, it was done. It was a problem for the club because it gets such headwinds, it's front page. And we decided to have a meeting at the Old Wedge on the, night, the next night. On my way, I got a phone call from Richard Greenbury, who was the chairman of Martin Spencer's at the time, Richard. And a big United fan. Big United fan. He says, well, don't let Cantona go. It'll give him great moments of joy. And I said, I know that. But, you know, it was the mood of the, the board. So I had to fight the case, like, we must keep him. We can't let him go. We can't give in to, to the mob. And we decided to, find, uh, to suspend him for four months. And the FA were, uh, at the time, were happy with it. But somehow, they added to it. Ahead of Cantona then, seven months of training. Dull, laborious, unfulfilling. Expediency may yet mean that, with regret, club and player part company. But as the great disciplinarian, wasn't your first instinct to think, he's blown it. He's a yeah. great player, I get on with him, but yeah. that's too much. Well, he never, he never given us any indication that explosion was there. But I decided to, to approach it this way. I would speak to him every day and I would talk to him about football all the time and they loved it, you know? And that's why all the players say it was my, my prodigal son. Uh, but I think he needed different attention. He needed different ways of dealing with him. He was a different guy from everyone else. He's an amazing human being. But when you saw that image of him kicking a spectator, wasn't there a bit of you thought, that's exactly the old discipline that's to stop at this club, I've got to get rid? No. There was something in me that said, I need to do something about it, I need to stand by him. Because the world is after him. And it was a bit like, um, no one was there to, to help him. And I said, well, it'll have to be me, because I'm his manager. I think... The thing that amazed me and used to frustrate me at times was his man management. I'd never seen him have a go at Eric Cantona, for example. Some of the players would resent that. Why is he not having a go at Cantona? He's missed a penalty. Or why is he not having a go at Cantona? He had an awful game. The manager knew in the long run that he would come good, that he would produce the goods at the right time. Yeah, his man management was, was second to none. You have always the honesty that allows him to be father, friend, uh, brother, of a player, enemy of a player, but enemy for a few a few seconds, but then the brother comes again, or the old brother, or the father. These human qualities are absolutely crucial to be a, a great leader. The fabulous leader is a very rare individual, and that person is capable of uh, making an organization do things, making the people in persuading, cajoling, nudging, caressing sometimes the people inside an organization to do something that they weren't, didn't think that they were capable of. What we have here essentially is a case that is about how one person is very effective at managing teams. That's not enough though for a leader. They also need to know how to cull their teams, how to be ruthless. Right. Yes, over here. When they had big players and they had the youth team coming through, the confidence to affect the change, sell the big players and, and go with the youth uh, players. A good leader has to make tough decisions. That's why he or, he or she is a leader. And sometimes there are things which are not very nice. Um, you have to lay off a whole group of people, for example. Two, three hundred people close down a factory. In some cases, you may have to release a, a very highly paid individual, but you have to do it. It's part and parcel of being a leader. As you go through your career, you've got to rebuild the team. You have to be ruthless. It's a hard part for you because they do become a family, you know, and the great squad of 94, of the Cantoners and the Inces and Robson and these players, Bruce, they get older. And the horrible thing is, the evidence is on the football field, and you can't avoid that. Some of these issues were played out in the press, but he wasn't afraid to make the decision which he thought was for the long-term or medium-term benefit of the team. And I think that ability to be ruthless is no bad thing. But at the same time, I think he did have compassion, and I don't think he necessarily found all these decisions easy. 
and it wasn't just players past their peak who were shown the red card by Ferguson. A scenario with Roy Keane, there was a video that he'd done for MUTV that the club didn't want to go out, the manager thought that it wasn't right, it was disrespectful, etc. to the team. The next day, told the players that Roy Keane would never come back to Man United again. He was captain of Man United. Roy Keane lifts the trophy for Manchester United. Best player probably Man United had for a long period of time. And that was for the next generation. Don't think you're ever bigger than this club, because you're not, because you will go. I've just told the captain he's never coming back again. What are you going to do now? Hey, this is ridiculous. <laughs> How do you handle a particularly difficult member of the team? That was a question which haunted a new Prime Minister, who turned to Sir Alex for advice. We would talk about man management, and I would say, look, such and such an individual is, is you know, he might, might be really brilliant, but he's really, really tough. I don't know why quite what to do about it. And because Alex, because this is how he would run his soccer team, he said, get rid of him. And I'd say, well, that's all very well, Alex, but how would you be if you got rid of a player but still found them in the dressing room every day? He said, oh, that, that would be a problem. He said, that would definitely be a problem. I said to him, you have to keep your control. I didn't know who he was talking about at the time. And you have to keep control. You can't lose your... You're the Prime Minister, you have to have control. You must uh, have guessed he was talking about Gordon Brown. I didn't know, actually... And I, I, I don't think anyone knew till later on that there's, there was some sort of a, there was some feeling between the two. He said to you, what do you do with a player who won't accept the discipline? And you said, get him out. If they're affecting the control of you or they're disrupting the dressing room, you have to make a decision, is it worth it? We weren't actually talking about an individual, but a hypothetical case, as it were. But, yeah, his, his attitude was, it doesn't matter if he's your best player, if he's difficult, put him out of the room. But even Sir Alex sometimes lived to regret his decisions about players. I always thought I was brave enough to make decisions. Maybe sometimes wrong. I made the wrong decision with Yap Stammer, and that was a mistake. One decision we've talked about quite a bit is the decision to let Yap Stam go to an Italian club. And I think it was based on um, his belief that maybe Yap Stam would not come back from his injury. It's a decision he regrets because Yap Stam went on to play for six seasons at a very, very high level. Played two European Cup finals. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's a good decision, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Changing the team only works, of course, if the people who replace those who are let go, the next generation, prove to be better. You're, you're mentioning youth players. What is characteristic of the Ferguson brand when it comes to youth? Yes? I think it's kind of given them a lot of, lot of chance to kind of shine and grow right. as a team. Right. No structure is going to remain standing unless it's built on a firm foundation. So for United, this meant, above all, developing a pipeline of young players um, who, when they were signed, weren't very well known or when they were purchased were um, in many instances uh, affordable and cheap purchases. Building a team around a new generation of talented kids may look a safe bet now. At the time, it was a risky gamble. So let's take a look at what became known as the class of 92. <laughs> OK. Look at Scalzi. You think he's just out of nursery? <laughs> <laughs> well, they weren't. I mean, what ages were they there? They would be 17, their gigs would be maybe 18. And some people look at that group and say, it was a one-off. You're a very lucky man. It's not unreasonable to say that, but I have to say this. We were scouting and trialling and coaching the best in the country. I'm sure of that. We were obviously characters and we were of the mindset that once we get in this team, we, we, we're, not, we're not going out of it. We were lucky in the fact that we had a manager who was willing to give us a chance and was willing to gamble, really, on, on, on youth. And remember this, some thought it wouldn't pay off. Brilliantly done. The trick is always buy when you're strong. So he needs to buy players. You can't win anything with kids. Alan Hansen, of course, told you you win nothing with kids. Well, you can't win anything without them. The secret was the development of the character, they feared nothing. So coming to the first team with me, it was a cakewalk for them. They just sailed through it, absolutely no problem. 
these young lads were old heads and young shoulders. We worked hard to get there. We worked hard, but yeah, we had the right, the right material. The first time I played, I was I come on as a substitute, and yeah, I can remember the manager's last words: "Just go out and enjoy yourself." And <laughs> you're thinking, "What do you mean, enjoy myself? Um, I'm going out to play. For, you know, I'm going out to play in front of forty odd thousand. And I'm 17. Um, I'll try and enjoy it, but I don't think I will." <laughs> But, um, no, he always said that, and, um, like I say, instantly you just, you just felt relaxed. That's part of my management and not putting too much pressure on, on me, but also knowing what I was capable of. And did you think of yourself almost as a father figure to them? That you were teaching them how to grow up, how to behave in the way your father taught you? I think that the character building does apply itself that way. And there are some instances where players would come to me with personal problems, knowing it would never go out the door, knowing they could trust me to help them. And I was proud that players would trust me that way. It was when my daddy uh, was sick in London uh, and he was in hospital, very bad. Uh, in coma. In coma. In a coma. And I, I had a conversation with, uh, with him and I say, boss, I, wanna, I don't feel good. Uh, and we had, we are in a, a key moment in the league, in the Champions League. But I said, I don't feel good. I want to, I want to see my dad, said, Cristiano. You want to go one day, two days, one week? You can go. I'm going to miss you. I miss you here because you know that you are important. But your your daddy is in the first place. When he told me that, I feel like this guy is unbelievable. He was the father of football for me. Cristiano Ronaldo with a shot. He knew what he had under his bonnet with Cristiano as well. He knew he had the potential to be a world star, best player on the planet. And he knew that there were certain aspects of his life that he needed to, to take care of and help him with. And I think you see that in the way when Cristiano speaks about the manager now. Even at all these years have gone by, he refers to him as, the, as his father in football, which is testament really to the way um, the manager dealt with him. Is that power? Yes, you have all the power. Yeah. <laughs> A bit of advice, I don't think power's very important. I really don't. I think the thing I was always after was to make sure I kept my, con my control. Ferguson imposed that control not just on the pitch, but off it too. When I first signed for United, I twisted my ankle in my first ever game, so I was out for about six weeks. So I got to know the city a little bit better than I probably should have. <laughs> and I, just as I got back to fitness, I went out on a training pitch and I saw the manager was just waiting out for the players to come out. And he just said, well, let me talk to you some. I said, my boss, he said, are you enjoying the city? Is it, is it all right? Have you been out anywhere or anything? I said, yeah, I've not been out, to be honest with you, boss. I've just been to a couple of restaurants and just taking it easy, just chilling out, really. He said, oh, good. He said, um, just make sure we get off on the right foot. Um, I know you've been overindulging in the nightclubs, going out here and there. People tell me these things. You can't hide none of this from me. Just make sure now you know that I know and it doesn't happen anymore if you want to stay at this club for a long time. Go on, go to train. I was like, oh, my God. The only thing I ever worried about was the control of Manchester United. The control of the players, the dressing room, that is paramount to me. And uh, I only worried if I ever lost that control. He controlled everything, I think. The transfer policy, the decisions, the players' contracts, um, the staff. I think everything was in his hands. And um, I think it's a fantastic way to do it especially if you are surrounded by, by good people. Um, because when you say um, you are in control, doesn't mean that you don't share. I think his belief is that in order to lead a football team effectively, you have to be the biggest personality. You can't have players that are the bigger stars, that are the bigger egos in the dressing room. This is probably also the most controversial lesson, and I am honestly not entirely sure whether we can translate this to, to many other business settings. And I think the business world nowadays, if you as a manager come in and say, or as a CEO and say, I demand absolute control and anyone who steps out of my control, they're fired, uh, that's a pretty harsh stance, and it, it might not work very well in the business climate that we have nowadays. I never thought about these guys being star players. Never bothered me. And t the one thing I did say to, to the star player, remember one thing, your reputation is always in the line of Saturday. So the expectation is bigger for you, 
And you have to show you work as hard as all the rest of the players because that really is a truly great player. Motivation, teaching the value of teamwork, they were also crucial to Ferguson's success, even if his methods could be a little unusual. There was one photograph he had on your office wall. Yeah. Let's just take a look at it. I want yeah. to know why you had it. There you are. Every year, I bring the apprentices into my office. One day, I says, right, tell me, what do, you, what do you think of that photograph? And they look at it, and of course, they're, they're all twitchy and nervous, etc. And I said, well, look, there's 11 there. There's 11 members of the team. I says, they built Rockefeller Centre back in the, the 20s, and they lost lives. And the, one or two would try to save them and lost their lives through that. I says, there's no bigger sacrifice than giving your life for a team. I remember he had this picture of 11 guys sitting in a room, but we're not, we, without, uh, uh, how you say? No ropes for safety. Exactly. And it quite surprised me. When I looked at the frame, I said, wow, it's unbelievable frame. And I say, Cristiano, this is what team should do it. We should be together. We should work together. We should do it everything together if we want to win something. And he gave the, the example all the time because he was 11 guys uh, in that picture. So it was fantastic memory. I remember right now in my eyes, I remember his office uh, and this frame. Now there's another image you used to use quite a bit, I think. Oh, yeah. Kiss. Yeah. It's, it's a fantastic story. It's how they fly 4,000 miles from Canada to some warm climate. They go in two Vs, and the ones at the front do most of the flying, then they change over. And if one goes away, and well, two have to look after it. It'd be birds overhead flying, and it would be in the middle of the training, and he'd stop the training, and he'd go, right, look, all up, all up, have a look up to the sky. So we'd be all looking at the side, see them birds, and they were all in like an arrow formation. That's teamwork. You can just imagine, 22 players or 20 odd players just looking up at the sky thinking, what's he going on about? And I said to them, these geese fly 4,000 miles to get better sun. All I'm asking you to do is play 38 games to win the week. I don't think I'm asking too much. Other teams in other sports wanted one of Fergie's inspirational talks. So when Europe was fighting to retain the Ryder Cup, the captain called in Sir Alex. I was never one of the superstars. So, so dealing with the likes of Rory McIlroy and how he was going to feel in that situation was something that was alien to me. And he was the one that um, I thought could really help me with that. So when I looked around, I thought, you know, there's a guy that, uh, that really got it right in terms of success. Paul had spoke to me a year before the, the tournament and asked if I'd like to contribute with the team. So I did a, a motivational talk with him. He spoke to the caddies before he came up to the players, uh, which was great. And that was a lot of fun for the caddies, and it made them very much included, because the caddies were a huge part of what we did. The caddies. Goodness me, that was fantastic. And the first caddy called Billy Foster, big Leeds United fan, and he gave me a stick. All of the boys says, you got Canton it, Canton it for nothing. As we were listening to the rules briefing, I could hear the laughter coming from the caddies room, and the players didn't know, but I could hear the, the laughter, so I knew things were going well down there. So when he came in, uh, first of all, he knew everybody's name um, and uh, addressed everybody personally. Sir Alex told the Ryder Cup team the story that had worked so well at Old Trafford. Did a bit of the geese, and I think that was an important one. The Ryder Cup team, although they were favourites, it wasn't going to win them the tournament. It was the work ethic, the concentration. They've got the talent. It's the 12 best golfers in Europe, without question. Uh, and they just need to focus on the things that are going to matter in the game. And that became a kind of a, something that, that we as a team mentioned a number of times during the week. Um, and it was, um, it was a, a phrase that we used, remember the geese. And the ironic thing about it is when, when we won and we were getting our, our photograph taken, this perfect V of geese flew right over their heads and over the clubhouse right behind. I never changed as a human being, as a, my style of management. My decision making, my discipline never changed that. But I was always going to change to make it better. Leadership is actually a balance of listening, learning, and leading. You know, you have to, to listen and absorb what are the lessons going on out there. You have to 
be prepared to, to learn those lessons and look at what the trends are and the changes are that are happening in your country, in your society, in your profession. And then you have to be prepared in the end to take control and to lead. Tony Blair says that leadership is a balance of listening, learning and leading. Is that a good summary? Yeah, I think these are accurate uh, statements, and no doubt about that. And you went to different places to learn. You went to the SAS on one occasion, didn't you? Years ago, I took the team down there for a day, and they stayed overnight. It was fantastic because you're speaking to a body of men who their concentration levels has to be 100% all the time. So well, I was impressed with what I saw down there. Did the players identify with them, or did they just look oh, they at them as it. if a different world? They loved it. I always remember they took us into the um, hostage room and they put four players with their heads down on the table and all the, the rest of the players were behind the rope, you know. They just pulled me out, me, Paul Ince, it's cardboard cutouts, and um, where the hostages, the cardboard cutouts are the people holding, the, holding us hot, hostage. So we were just sat there at the table Next minute, lights just went off. We heard, get down, get down, which we instantly did. And all of a sudden, a smoke bomb comes in. And I think it goes dark, and within seconds, bang, 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 bang. A couple of bullet sounds, and then the lights come on. And right next to us was four or five soldiers, SAS gear, night goggles. And the, so, when the soldiers were gunned against Paul Ince's head, <laughs> and see, I tell you. What did Incy do? <laughs> well, ah! it's, he absolutely, honestly, he knew he died. It was brilliant. Yeah, it was a great experience. Great experience and one that um, we, we never forgot. What I hope Sir Alec and his team would have seen and appreciated was very high degree of professional skill and ability and utter dependence one upon another. In other words, the team actually brought to a very high pinnacle of mutual dependence and respect. The Ferguson formula produced year after year of success, but one victory, one match, one extraordinary moment seemed to capture its essence. Let's take a look at one night. One night in Barcelona. In yeah. 1999. Beckham crosses from the left, right footed, it's a clear header, and it's into the net! Yeah. Solskjaer has won the European Cup for Manchester United! So United were 1 0 down, going into injury time. That gesture, was that disbelief? I think it was a bit of that, but, um, but when, when I went to 1 each, Steve McLaren came to me and says, We'll go back to 4 4 2 in extra time. I says, No, the game's over. They'll never recover and we scored a second goal. They were gone. Bayern were absolutely gone. Those three minutes, in a sense, are like the whole Ferguson formula boiled down, aren't they? Well, that particular team um, was a team that never, never gave in. And throughout that season, they continually won games in the last few minutes. To win the league once is, is very difficult. Uh, but to do it over 26 years, I think, is simply amazing. I was able to plan three and four years ahead because I was there long enough. Even having won the coveted treble, Ferguson set about dismantling his team and creating another. I think his greatest legacy is that he had success over a quarter of a century and that he was able to build and rebuild four or five truly great teams. Uh, for me, that is something that no manager has matched. The rebuilding of the organization was consistent. And often people, when they've built a structure or got a, uh, uh, an entity into a winning position, they forget what took them there and they stop doing the renovation, they stop doing the repairs. So Alex didn't stop. And he rebuilt the club on perpetual four-year cycles. You smile inside because you say, He's still hungry, he still want to win, he's still motivated to win trophies, to go to the trainings with 62 years old, 63, 64, 65. You see, he's still angry, he still want one more title, he still want that team play good every weekend. So this is, for me, it was a surprise. 
But, but the lesson for a leader is that the very moment you reach the top is what? You're at the top, you don't, it's like climbing a mountain, you go up there and the view is beautiful. In normal circumstances, you have to come down the mountain, not in football. For Manchester United, you have to stay, stay up there and look at the view. You can't come down. And of course, you don't win every week, but the important thing is to be challenging every time. And that was a big thing in my United. It was never about, oh, we've won, let's celebrate for days on end, months on end, and really enjoy it. You never got a sense that we really enjoyed it as much as maybe should have now I've retired. I think if I did enjoy it too much, because I, I did quite like enjoying things, um, maybe I wouldn't have been able to climb the mountain again so soon and so consistently. You have some managers that, uh, that you work hard for because you fear them. And you have other managers that you work hard for because you love them. Where on this line is Sir Alex? <laughs> Some people are pointing. <laughs> Where on this line is he? Yes, over there. I think he's more towards the love side. <laughs> no, it's a fact. OK, you need to stop talking right now. <laughs> so for you, was it more fear? Or was it love? Or maybe both? Both. Both. Uh... In the beginning, it's kind of not scare, but it's respectful. You respect because you say, "Oh, it can smile, but it can be angry too." So let's do the right things. Early on in my career, definitely fear. As a 17-year-old, seeing um, this figure who was so intent on discipline and um, and quality. But also fear from me, fear of failure. But then as the career and the relationship grew, more towards, yeah, the love aspect. There can be occasions with fear come into it, occasions maybe a, a bit of love. But in the case of fear, if you look at the way Manchester United played, players played and the teams played, there's no way that fear was in that team. In terms of my time at United, I often wondered whether it was hate, fear, love. I didn't pay great attention to it, but I still was always concerned about the balance of it. And I have to say this, it's right there, respect. I think that love or fear is an inappropriate statement, quite frankly. It's respect. I think that people should respect you. And if they don't respect you, uh, then you've lost it. You've basically lost it. It's as simple as that. Ferguson was to win the respect of his rivals as well as his own team. I played against Man United with Porto. And the respect started when um, in that Man United Porto, the first time, um, the opposite manager knocked in my door to congratulate my players. So Alex walks in? Yeah. And that in our Portuguese culture was, uh, doesn't belong to our culture. And from that moment, I owe him respect, and I always gave him uh, my respect and my admiration. Sir Alex retired in 2013 to be with his wife, Cathy, following the death of her sister. Champions! He went out at the top after winning his 13th Premier League title. And we kept it quiet, nobody knew, not in my sons, nobody knew, until David Gill wanted to see me on a Sunday afternoon. And um, he came along and says, I'm retiring. I said, so am I. <laughs> I remember being asked in the late 90s when I was a finance director going around the city, it was, you know, presenting the results. We were quoted on all the stock exchange saying, you know, what's going to happen when Alex Ferguson retires? You know, what's going to happen? So without doubt, it was when Alex left, it was going to be, it was a sea change for the club. You, know, you don't have a person as important and as um, influential and successful as that for many, many years without being a sea change you know, with people, what's happened. There's always a bit of uncertainty. And he went out after a very successful season, and I think, it's, uh, personally, I think it was the right decision. He told me a, a huge secret. Not many people knew, like, one month or two months before the decision to be, to be made to stop. I know that he trusts me, because if he doesn't, he doesn't tell me. But I was, I was scared. I was scared. So when finally he informed the media about his decision, 
was a sense of relief. The man chosen to replace Ferguson was no big name, no proven winner. David Moyes survived less than a year. Many blame Sir Alex for appointing his friend. Now, one of the biggest issues for any leader is when to go, when to call it a day, and how to plan the succession. Did you get it right? On a succession, when I announced my retirement, do you honestly believe that one man could decide the future of Manchester United? It's absolute nonsense. There was a good process. They're a professional football club. They know what they're doing. The Glazers, David Gill, Josie was going back to Chelsea. Carlos Ancelotti was going to Real Madrid. Jurgen Klopp has signed a contract at Dortmund. Uh, Louis van Gaal was, staying, was doing with Holland in the World Cup. Probably every manager in the world looks at Man United as a huge club, but um, I wanted to come to Chelsea. And um, we didn't brought that into the table because we, we were so open and he knows so much about myself that he knew that for a, almost a season, I want to leave Real Madrid and I want to, to come to Chelsea. The other thing was, I took Pep Guardiola for dinner in New York on the September and I had no idea I was ever going to retire. And I said to him, give me a call, when, when, tell me what you're going to do. No, no, no answer. I don't think we made a mistake at all. I think we chose a, a good football man, did a great job at Everton, 11 years there, we, we picked the right man. Unfortunately, it didn't work for David. Yeah, well, sometimes people say, don't they, the critics, well, it was impossible for David Moyes because he inherited this team and you'd stop trying. There's this continual thing about um, we left an old team and all that nonsense. We won the league by points. It's unbelievable. The average age of my teams consistently in all the years, the 20 years that we went from the start to winning the championship, was 27 to 28, every year. If Ryan Giggs had retired, say, six, seven years ago, and he retired at, say, 35, quite a while I would have made him my assistant. And quite a while he could have moved right into the job with the experience of being an assistant manager to me, as he's doing in helping Louis van Gaal at the moment. But I would never ask a player to quit. He said that. I mean, I obviously played until I was 40. It's obviously a completely different job, completely different mindset going from playing to coaching. So it would have been great for me personally to, to work under Sir Alex, um, to see how he worked behind the scenes, because you don't really see that as a player. We'd like to have spoken to many managers, believe me, because that's a process. We'd like to have asked them what they felt about leaving a big club to go to the bigger club, to come to Manchester United, but it wasn't there for us. I think they did, we did the best under the circumstances we're in. Uh, we have come to the end of the session. Let's give it up for Sir Alex. Now, we've spent a long time analysing your leadership and the lessons for others. How would you sum it up? Well, I think consistency is... I think it probably sums me up. I think that... I know, 26 and a half years I was there, I never changed my conviction or my philosophy or my, my attitudes. That consistency created players who were consistent, the club were consistent, and that's what's made them the best club in the world, without question. My day job is in investment banking, so I learned a lot from how he's dealt with very highly paid individuals. What really came across was his passion, and so you could see how much he loved what he does. The key thing is how to lead very young teams of very talented people and being able to get them to deliver the most. Understanding about how to manage a talent pipeline, bringing players in. His ability to constantly renew himself. And I think there's a great lesson in it for all of us.